Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Patricia Kong. Very excited to have today with me two great speakers. Um, we have Dave West from Scrum.org and Christopher Hanscom uh, from McKinsey. So they're going to be talking about um, we hear a lot about the hype around Agile, uh, potentially, and they're actually going to give us some evidence today. Um, we all know that I'm very passionate about evidence-based management, so we're going to go through and look at how Agile has affected the bottom line for several organizations. So I am going to be taking your questions today. Um, there is a question box on the right side, I think, of your screens. Um, I think in the last 10, 15 minutes, we'll go through those questions. So I'll be monitoring those um, and I'll pop back in at that time. So I'm going to quickly just kick it over to, to Dave West because there's a lot of information, a lot of case studies for us to cover today. All right, have fun. Thanks. Thanks, Trish. I appreciate it. What she was meaning is that Christopher and I can't shut up and we like to say thousands of words to describe everything. But hi, everybody. My name is Dave West. I'm the CEO here at Scrum.org and I've been working, gosh, for probably three years with Christopher and uh, McKinsey on trying to really find out all sorts of things around Agile. Uh, as you know, um, I'm not going to speak for McKinsey here, but as you probably know that McKinsey are heavily involved in massive transformations and actually some of the transformations of Scrum.org are. So what's interesting is we're now trying to bring this sort of two organizations together to really get some of this um, understanding and insight to, to, the, to the world. Some of you may have seen another webinar that we delivered around the agile personality, which is, which is great. So um, Dave West at Scrum.org, if you want to, you know, argue with me afterwards or send me some very complimentary emails, feel free to do that. And of course you can tweet me, etc. And I'm very excited to introduce Christopher Hanscom, um, who I've been working with with um, some other people from McKinsey for the last few years. And and it's interesting, though we though we both obviously have got English accents, uh, I actually live in America, he lives in England. So it's always good to sort of hear how my accent has uh, become a lot less English over time. Um, so let me just first tell you a little bit about Scrum.org in case you don't know Scrum.org. How can you not know Scrum.org? I don't know, where have you been? Under a rock. Um, so we do training, certification. We were founded by Ken Schwaber, the creator of Scrum. Well, we have uh, about 340 professional Scrum trainers all over the world. Uh, Pre-COVID, training between five and 7,000 people a month now. We've now gone virtual like everybody, so slowly those numbers are, are creeping back up again. And then obviously certification and the like. But I'm more interested in the body of knowledge and the, the underlying sort of ideas around agility. So that's what Scum.org is. Now, Christopher, I'm, just in case people don't know who McKinsey are. Yeah, so McKinsey, a global management consultancy, over 30,000 people all around the world. Um, we help clients in public sector, private sector, uh, design and deliver change that matters to them. Um, and particularly relevant, I guess, for, for this call over the last five years or so, we've increasingly invested in building knowledge around agility and have supported well over 100 client organizations undergo large scale agile transformations over that period of time. Yeah. And it's, it's been really interesting working with you over the last, you know, three or so years because a totally different perspective from you know the scrum which historically has been very team centric product centric software centric and it and it's interesting how these two two worlds are coming together because they kind of have to in in 2019 yeah. christopher and i i think have presented this slide be, before maybe changed some of the pictures but ultimately the essence we talked a lot about why organizations need to become more agile you know we talked a lot about you know socio-political changes around the world, whether it's, you know, uh, um, uh, President Trump or whether it's Brexit. We talked a lot about sort of like the the, the changes of, um, of, of, of certain, you know, environments. And particularly, we talked also about how technology organizations are not exempt from that. You know, the challenges that Facebook face as they, as, as the use of technology and the change in demographics and sort of globalization talks, talks about. It. And we talked a lot about Thomas Friedman, um, who wrote a book, you know, Thank You For Being Late, which which described globalization, climate change, population change, and Moore's law, all coming together to create this sort of perfect environment of, of change. 
now it's 2020 <laughs> and oh my gosh it's sort of it's sort of on steroids really or on viruses it's it's become a lot more um exasperated covid-19 the coronavirus has taught us i think that agility and change is just the reality. Obviously, the global spread highlighted how dependent we were on, on globalized structures. You know, population densities and the change in populations showed that very clearly. And then technology that's been levied against it, highlighted or against COVID-19 to, to cure it, really, you know, has, is, is, is very, very exciting. And really, I think COVID-19 and Christopher, I'm going to talk a little bit about more Christopher than me about the fact that it sort of highlights the importance of agility. I mean, I think it's just as you're watching this, you're probably in a very different environment than you would have been watching this in, right? And that is ultimately <laughs> you're having to be a little bit more agile, you know, to balance family and work, to understand what your customers are doing, to think about how you're going to supply them, how you're going to engage with them, how you're going to work with your supply chain, how you're going to work with your employees, everything has changed. And, and I think this um, diagram sort of sums it up. What we're seeing is in most organizations that they have to be, there's all these teams, all these groups of people working in the most responsive way possible. And organizations that are huge and slow and unresponsive can't really uh, respond in that way. Um, it's funny, you know, but many organizations, and we've seen that with how healthcare systems have adapted to, to COVID and how governments are responding. The, the more, the larger and less agile they are, the less responsive they are, and ultimately the, 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 the outcomes are not fantastic. And we, we wonder why that is. So why don't organizations look like this, Christopher? Yeah, so I think uh, the problem is that organizations have been built fundamentally for a different age. Uh, for many years, our clients have complained that it's just not easy or, or certainly it's not fast for them to get many things done. Um, they have overly rigid processes, uh, siloed, inflexible organizational structures. And on the IT side of things, you, know, you often have monolithic systems that were fit more for the last century than this one. Um, many features, many of these features were designed with the best of intents, right? There was no ill intent behind all of this. Um, and often this made sense if prioritizing efficiency, um, especially in slowly changing markets. But today they're just killing many organizations. Yeah. And and I think that, oh, I think that, uh, sorry, I think that this, this sort of diagram sums it up. Um, yeah, I think we believe it's time for a different type of organization now. So moving away from this, organization as a machine type of thinking of the previous age and toward a more organic, self-organizing, frankly, a more agile organizational model that's required to win today. Yeah. So what, what does that, what, what does business agility really mean though? Because, you know, we often hear the word business agility. Yeah. Well, so let me first and foremost tell you what it doesn't mean, right? It, this is not <laughs> a free for all across the organization. And I mean, I, I say that only half joking. I think one of the uh, most common misconceptions I come across is that uh, somehow stability and scale need to be sacrificed for speed and flexibility. Um, in fact, I would argue quite the opposite. In, in contrast, a, a truly, truly agile organization, we think requires a stable backbone of culture, of uh, a set of core process, of platforms, to enable this dynamic ecosystem of mission-based teams that, that we think of when we think of an agile organization. Yeah. Anyone who's actually experienced working in an agile organization or, or even an individual agile team will know that there's tremendous rigor and structure to ways of working, or often frankly more so than in many traditional organizations. But hey Dave, do you want to bring that to life a bit more? Yeah, so what, what's interesting is when we look at this, 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 this diagram or this slide, what we see is that great teams, Agile is built on the top, which well, sounds awful, doesn't it say it like that? Sounds like we're sort of oppressing them, but we're actually not, we're liberating them, built around these amazing teams. Enterprise agility requires you to have these amazing teams, focus, mission, empowered, self-organizing. There's obviously the really famous piece called the new, new product game, which sort of kicked off 
the evolution of Scrum, they describe these innovative teams being little scrums that have a clear direction. They know how to win the game. They have a clear purpose. They're empowered, though, to do what it takes to do that. They don't necessarily now have to be co-located, we talk a little bit about that, but they have to be small and nimble, small enough to get, uh, large enough to get the work done, but small enough that the overhead of the team doesn't in inhibit them. And they focus on the things that are most important. Supporting them though, is the sort of an organization that has a clear mission, platform yeah. that supports them. And, and I think that's super important as well. You know, the, the, the more successful these teams are is because of the environment that supports them. That's a, it takes away some of the waste that gets in the way of them making progress. It, it enables them around transparency, you know, around a, a very transparent environment where saying things are wrong, things are broken and we'd like to do it a different way isn't frowned upon, it's actively encouraged. You know, the culture of the organization encourages, encourages agility through transparency. And then supported in terms of skills, Team size, it has to be relatively small, but you need all the skills to do the work, which means you have to support those people. They may not have all the skills. It's, it's like a bit like a startup, really. You never kind of have enough skills to build the product, <laughs> but you sort of fake it, make it, and find others to help you. And that's ex exactly the model that, we, that, 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 that enterprise agility is. And then, of course, you know, what you end up doing is building these teams to be aligned to the customers and to the aligned to the outcomes that you seek. And then that allows you to plan the, the size and the complexity of them based, based on that, which is which is super interesting. But what the, the fundamental question, though, and the purpose of today's um, um, webinar, and I'm sorry, if I look down, it's because Christopher's sitting on this screen over here. So it sort of confuses everybody. But <laughs> I still um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, it still looks the same. Anyway, is the fundamental question is, yeah, all sounds very simple. Of course, it's obvious you want small teams aligned to customers, clear mission, empowered, supported in an environment that allows rapid learning, you know, the, the five traits, etc. But the question is, does it really, uh, you know, is it actually measures, is it successful? How do we measure success? Are we seeing success or is it just makes us all feel better and we feel happier? You know, and that that is the fundamental question that that we're that we're asking today. And you know, and Christopher, this is the sort of like the heart of all of the research that we found. So, do you want to just quickly walk the audience through this? Yes, we're seeing success in these sort of levels. Yeah. So, first of all, let me say what we did. So, I mean, we we went and did research together, collected outcome data from 22 different companies across the world, across six different sectors that had completed an agile transformation, either um, across a, a business unit or across the entire organization, the entire enterprise. Um, so we excluded, we didn't look at organizations that implemented agility solely um, at individual team level, uh, team or squad level, or just within one function. Um, this, was, this was more business-wide, organization-wide. And then for those 22 companies, we tracked a broad set of outcome metrics during the Agile transformation. And these outcome metrics can broadly be synthesized into the four categories uh, shown on this page, what, what we've dubbed the Agile Impact Engine. So that's customer satisfaction, employee engagement, operational performance, and then finally, financial performance, perhaps as an overarching outcome of the, of the previous three. Almost all of the companies in our sample saw improvements across all of the dimensions. Uh, and on average, the improvements were significant. So to start walking through some of those, uh, for employees working in small teams with clear missions and empowered to deliver, um, typically that led to 20 to 30 point improvement in employee engagement measures. The customer centricity at the core of an agile organization um, was time and again seen to actually translate to real customer outcomes um, up to 10, uh, sometimes up to 30 point improvements seen in customer engagement metrics, things like net promoter scores or the like. Operational performance metrics um, you know, varied, the actual metrics themselves vary quite significantly by industry on this dimension. So, uh, you know, we, we used uh, actual different metrics depending on which of the six sectors the company was in. Um, but on a, on a relative uh, on a relative basis, 
um, operational performance store, saw a real step change. In fact, actually, amongst the biggest improvements of all of the different, the four different uh, elements of the impact engine here. Um, so, whilst indeed precise metrics vary by industry, improvements are between 30 and sometimes up to even 50 percent um, were improved, were seen on this operational dimension. And then, of course, all of this translated to financial performance, um, which across the sample was estimated to improve by between 20 up to 30 percent in some cases from the different companies. Mm. So just a word about one thing that was really interesting about the research is that though we found that all these organizations were focusing on one or two elements of the agile transformation, they all would do having a, what we describe as holistic because that's management consultant talk, but they were doing a, 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 a an agile transformation that was considering all elements that the, the um, McKinsey calls the, the the five traits you know we focus on this sort of broader sort of scrum model we, you, know, uh, you know shared purpose network of teams rapid yeah. learning cycles people centric you know and support organization and technology is obviously a part of it what was really interesting was that though they may have been focusing on trying to better align teams to the customer and to the outcomes and we'll talk a little bit about an airline that was very focused on that other they realized quite quickly that you had to do other things to make that happen you couldn't just do that on its own though you may potentially get improved customer engagement a little blip systemically it sort of like dissolves and goes away so this sort of anti-pilot model though you may yeah. pilot you're piloting in the context of a broader change initiative that's what i that was surprised me christopher um yeah. I, I don't know about you i i actually may be kind of happy because i've seen so many i mean at scrum.org you know millions of people come to our website we talk all over the world we see lots and lots of organizations and one thing that was very clear was it's great to be focused and and I see all these organizations that are, but it's better if you think holistically and actually have a, a broader view. So I thought that was sort of refreshing. So shall we start and go deep dive into some of the actual organizations and some of the examples around each of these four elements? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so maybe if we move to the first case. So this is talking about Spark New Zealand Telco. Um, and as I mentioned, the organizations in our sample experienced a 20 to 30 point improvement in engagement, uh, employee engagement in agile environments compared with a non-agile environment. Um, and this was seen whether engagement was measured by employee willingness to recommend their workplaces or by internal satisfaction surveys uh, or, or other metrics. Different companies use different approaches. Um, and we, we believe that this is because in the non-hierarchical organization of cross-functional teams, employees have the opportunity to develop a strong sense of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. You know, those three central drivers for, for employee experience. So the case, so Spark, the largest telco in New Zealand, they launched an enterprise-wide adult transformation covering two and a half or so thousand people. Um, with improved employee engagement as a leading goal uh, of the transformation, alongside increasing customer centricity and faster time to market. Throughout the transformation, the company's operating model went through an overhaul. Yeah. They transformed uh, from a hierarchical, multi-layered, traditional organizational structure into something that was much simpler, um, three layers top to bottom, consisting of leadership, um, a leadership squad, they called it the evolution of the leadership team, um, 18 tribes and approximately 200 autonomous teams, uh, autonomous squads. And then thinking about autonomy, mastery and purpose. So autonomy was embedded in this case by creating those small cross-functional teams and ensuring that they were designed to have full end-to-end -end accountability for specific missions and products. So that's uh, the autonomy. Uh, mastery grew from, from the need for people who could apply knowledge across a broad range of situations while also having deep knowledge in one area. And the new setup, the new people model that went alongside of that recognized individuals for their technical skills and allowed growth in expertise. So not just through movement into management, um, but really taking a multidimensional contribution model and recognizing mastery. And then finally, purpose. Purpose was created through an inspiring North Star. 
uh, uh, translated from the top into clear goals and missions for each each and every squad in the organization. Uh, concrete tools like uh, OKRs allowed the North Star to act as a common language between these distributed and autonomous teams. Yeah. So as a result, sorry, Dave. No, no, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that the, the so what of all of this employee engagement scores in uh, most of the agile tribes now significantly exceed levels seen even in not just telco but many actually of the if you think of the iconic digital natives um, of this world and so this allows uh, what what is as a telco a, a, an industry that's been around for 100 or so years to really compete in the market for talent um, with uh, with these new te tech natives um, and consequently uh, outperforming peers in financial performance as well so what, what's interesting is, I mean, to quote Richard Branson, keep your employees happy, keeps your customers happy, which keeps your shareholders happy, right? That's what he always used to say. But what's really interesting, and you can see it here in the in the photograph that's been grayed out so that you can't actually see the sprint goal, but that, that North Star translating down into the work actually of the of the teams, squads, and in their in their appropriate tribe is really really interesting because ultimately that as expressed in okrs then drive that common language so everybody knows where they're going so it's not surprising that that level of employee engagement but it wasn't on its own you couldn't just get employees you had to, you know north it it talks of north star it also talks yeah. of having that people-centric support what we see in many organizations is particularly for pilot agile pilot projects what they do is they bring the best people together yes and then they, they're successful, no surprise. They have a clear purpose, no surprise. They have a support, infrastructure. they get the ability to do what they need to do, everything's great. Then when you try to make that grow outside, you're like, well, we haven't got that many great people. Uh, and, and you're like, well, and so suddenly it starts falling apart. Having that support network in place really emphasized and sort of amplified their ability to, for that, um, mastery to sort of become super important i love that i think that decoupling sort of like people management from work delivery is is a super super characteristic and and, and very very interesting um okay shall we shall we talk a little bit now about operational performance christopher yeah um so let's move to the next example so this is an australian uh, oil and gas company um a, a big lng liquefied natural gas exporter um, and, and this case comes from, I think, four or five years ago, um, struggling to survive in, a, in, an era, in an era where LNG spot prices in Asia, their major market, were collapsing. So they, they had a, a strong um, market-driven cost uh, pressure and a, and a real need to transform internally. Taking inspiration from many North American uh, independent oil and gas companies, they decided, uh, they heard about agility. Um, they actually went to visit many many companies more mature from other sectors, banks, uh, digital natives, telecommunication companies, um, and they decided to embark on an agile transformation in order to unlock the step change they were looking for in terms of productivity and ultimately cost reduction. And, uh, and, and through doing this, they saw spectacular results um, across a range of industry-specific operational performance metrics. So to take maybe just a couple of examples, um, uh, well planning and well execution um, was uh, uh, with uh, onshore production. This was you know, something where they were drilling thousands of wells a year. Um, so important in terms of cycle time, um, driving directly cost. And by implementing a, an agile model within the enterprise agile framework, they were able to halve the time that it took to plan and execute wells uh, compared with the traditional model where it was done by groups of people coming together from classic functional silos. So real significant improvement on, on that type of dimension. Um, taking a, a maybe a slightly broader metric, overall gas production increased by five to 10%, which maybe doesn't sound too impressive, but at the same time, this was done against uh, a, a decreasing size of the workforce. So for them, actually, the key metric was uh, volumes produced per FTE per head in the organization. Um, and that increased by 70 to 80%. Wow. 
so this was driven um, uh, by elements of the model, uh, you know, radical delayering, empowering the front line, going back to some of the autonomy mastery purpose things we were talking about before, um, and accelerated decision making that was enabled through moving to this this agile model. Yeah. And so ultimately, bringing this all together, translating to around 400 million US dollars of cost savings per year. We, you, the thing that was struck me about this particular case and, and these um, this uh, organization was they were in a pretty challenging market. I'm not gonna, you know they were having some issues, and they took because they took a risk because they did dip in operational performance when they went through the op, when they went through the implementation. Right, you know the bottom line is as they were trying to organize stuff, they actually did have some challenges, but with but their belief in the ultimate model. The, the the focus on the outcomes that were they were focusing on and trying to get you know having these okay are these metrics front and center made ultimately they ended in a in a in a great place but I think it's very um yes they were quite risky I, I could, in their heads I I know I would have been a little bit scared during this process but um but they they carried on and ended up with a, a really great at set of outcomes. Yeah, and I think often the case in um, some of these more operational or certainly high hazard type environments where agility is implemented is um, you need to construct a, 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 an agile journey, a transformation approach. So the, the risks that matter, so process safety, personal safety risks yeah. are well managed and, and, and those there's no way can get out of hand. But at the same time, like you say, Dave, leaders need to understand that yeah, you know, whether it's at the team level or at the unit level or the organizational level, performance will go through a hockey stick, um, and you know it's, it, it will go down before it goes back up. And you should expect that. You should expect the noise that comes when you're sort of slightly lower in the hockey stick, um, and uh, and be ready to push through. Yeah, and uh, that was uh, obviously safety, and you know, um, some, they had many things that they would just table stakes you just cannot yeah. you know who cannot change but everything else they were willing to sort of try some different things and the leadership demonstrated um uh, an appetite to to accept that and and deal with the, the impact uh, that really really improved you know and time to market cycle time um and of course it spoke and this is the trouble with these when we talk about these case studies that of course there was engagement that had a huge so it's you know employee engagement had an impact on this right and this is a kind of the point of this model that that's come out the four elements because you know the engagement really helped the operational performance and yeah etc cetera, etc cetera, which is not not a surprise so maybe we should move on to Actually, talking of engagement, customer engagement, this is something that you know one of one of mine. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, or, um, airline in the U.S. Um, they, over the last few years, have transformed the way in which they think about the customer. And actually, interestingly, I, I spoke to a few different airlines. <laughs> I seem to speak a lot to airlines. I guess because I used to travel on them a lot. Now I, I sort of wish for that moment in at thirty thousand feet. But um, it was interesting that the, the, the customer historically hadn't really been king. So they realigned their entire organization to focus on that customer, to focus on that, that sort of like that North Star of what we're trying to do for the customer. They made the customer front and center in everywhere. So you would go to a, a team I was going to say squad them, but this is Scrum. <laughs> um, um, you go to a team, and uh, they they had not only did they have a fabulous Scrum board or Kanban board on you know, talking about work, sprint goal, all this sort of stuff. They had a picture of the customer on the on the wall, which is which is great. And then this is you know Aunt Mabel. She's trying to get to see her her niece and nephew and their kids. She lives in Wyoming, and you know how can we provide a better service to you know. And even though this particular uh, team was not involved in the whole value stream, they were every time they did a sprint review, they talked about Aunt Mabel, um, which kind of became sort of ironic. But the, the point is, you know, this sort of the other thing that was really interesting is the sort of well, the, the point is that they clearly understood the, what they were trying to achieve and the customer was king throughout. The other thing that was interesting. And this is also consistent with the Asian telecom company that's in the in the study was this idea process. 
you know, the fact that historically a bunch of really smart guys, may, maybe somebody as good looking as Christopher would come in and have fantastic ideas, right? And then it would, they'd disavow you or whatever. Now, as fabulous as Christopher's ideas are, and they are pretty amazing, I've been working with him for a long time, it, the best ideas came from the people that are actually engaged with the customers from the bottom up. You know, they talked about sort of like this idea flow, uh, you know, sort of idea. So what that meant was that the, hey, we need to change this for the cabin staff to help Aunt Mabel. We need to, you know, and it suddenly became this, these ideas percolated up, which changed the way in which the customer was served by the organization. And everybody cared about that. And, and I think that, that, you know, and you can see an MPS here, which was the metric that, that, that they were using uh, around it. The industry average is 43, which isn't bad. I was actually, I was like, oh, I'm surprised the airline industry is 43 <laughs> based on my experience. But they, you can see, they, they blew that out of the water and, uh, and continue to blow that out of the water. It's interesting, you know, when we talk about COVID, how, how they're going to respond to that is going to be also super, super interesting. But, um, uh, but uh, I don't know. Any, anything to add around customer engagement, Christopher? No, I mean, I think um, not specifically customer engagement, but I think one of the themes that listening to these three cases that comes across is that um, in, in all of these cases, we see improvement, not just on, in this case, customer engagement, but you know, here also employee experience and, and no doubt financial performance as well. And, and likewise on the other cases. And, and this this was actually one of the insights confirmed through the research in that you know it's actually quite hard. To, um, some some companies would go into the agile transformation saying I really want to focus on improving customer experience or maybe focus on improving employee engagement. It's actually quite hard to only improve one of these metrics. You, know, you typically find that um, you get improvement across um, across all of the dimensions of the the impact engine. And I think, David, goes back to what you were saying at the start about, you know, how you as an organization achieve this, you know, what an agile organization actually is, an integrated system. And we, we talk about these five trademarks um, that, that you alluded to. So the, the, the shared purpose across the organization, the network of, uh, of empowered teams, the rapid decision and learning cycles, that dynamic people model and then the next generation enabling technology. So those five trademarks that show up differently, but really are at the heart of all truly agile organizations, that's what's required to be put in place by each of these uh, different examples we've spoken about. And if you do that, we see consistently you get improvement across a, a range of, uh, of different impact dimensions. Which brings us nicely to the ultimate you know, Jerry Maguire, show me the money, right? You know, um, yeah. Perhaps uh, yeah, the so that's question. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So indeed, can can improvements in customer satisfaction, employee engagement, and operational metrics such as speed um, really uh, translate into financial uplifts? Um, and and honestly, I think this is this is one of the hardest ones to prove because where it's almost all organizations in our sample tracked productivity gains and cost savings. Few systematically looked at revenue or margin uplift um, and you know, citing difficulties in either baselining the pre-transformation state um, or, or other reasons. Um, and so this led to you know, actually when we looked at financial performance and you'll, and you'll see if you read the full paper, there's maybe a slight overemphasis on things like cost savings um, as opposed to sort of other elements of financial performance. Um, nonetheless, we do have some quantitative and lots of qualitative uh, evidence of revenue-based improvements also um, as a consequence of agile transformations. So for yeah. example, uh, and shown on this page, um, a LATAM bank decided to go agile in one of its business units. Um, and, imply, and by applying a, a so-called sort of no middle managers type rule, reduce the number of layers from three uh, to three from seven that it was previously. Um, it had dedicated people uh, moved into a, a, a squads type structure, uh, removed silos between the business and IT. Many of these same features that we've spoken about um, showing up time and again in agile transformations. 
And by doing this, as they tracked uh, productivity, they found they saved 30% full-time equivalent um, basis of, of employees. Um, now, uh, now, now we come to actually another common feature, you know, what you then do as an organization with productivity improvements um, through an agile transformation is very much a strategic choice, right? So you may choose to uh, translate that to headcount reduction, and many organizations do. The, in this case, um, the, the bank didn't do that. They, they identified the employees freed up uh, through productivity great gains as new capacity and redeployed them to new growth type roles within the agile organization, the newly agile company. Yeah, I think that's super interesting as well, because, you know, it's the, the benefits, obviously, you know, you got teams doing a lot more, you know, this 2020 response in time for 2018, you know, the, the bottom line is that they did a lot more than they planned to do because they had freed up people that could work on it. Um, you know, Christopher probably said that very, you know, very eloquently, but the bottom line is they, they were going through their backlog super quick. So they, they didn't need as many people as they thought they did. So they basically added more to the backlog, sprung yeah. up a new team and, and started working on it, which is, which is, which is really, really interesting. And, and I think that in this world of, I, I dare I say abundance, Christopher, the opportunity for these organizations, if they produce more products, if they focus on their customer more, if they engage with their customer more, if they, all of that, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. All these companies have huge opportunities to do yeah. more, to create more value, to grow more. And so this freeing up of FTEs, this fo uh, focus on efficiency, you know, is, is great for them. You know, there's, there's, the backlogs don't get smaller, as it were. No, and I think Dave, that that also sort of highlights why, when you talk about agility at a, an enterprise level or, or even a business unit level, um, some of these backbone processes, thinking about how do you prioritize across teams, how do you redeploy people, become so important. Because I think each and every team will have items in their backlog that they could be doing with freed up productivity, but you need a process, a mechanism to look across all of those backlogs and make sure that with that freed up capacity, you're working on what truly is the highest value um, activity for the organization as a whole and are able to reallocate dynamically resources based upon that. And the other thing that I heard and, and saw in these case studies was they actually had time to improve the way they worked. They had time to do that for the first time ever. They weren't just chasing their tails or the, so that improvement to how they worked ultimately gave them more time, which allowed them to do more stuff in its like sort of cycle of, of craziness. Yes. Uh, they got better and better and happier because they actually felt like they were getting stuff done as well, which is, um, you know, yeah. and, and then that led to the autonomy. The point is that it, it really is one of those things where you press this and something comes out here and everything's connected in an almost sort of crazy, crazy way. So obviously today, you know, many of you ladies and gentlemen are sitting at, at home. Uh, hopefully the, the kids aren't annoying you too much or um, you've managed to brave the supermarket um um for the first time in a month or whatever so co covid is the reality and you know the you this study and the work that we did was pre covid and yeah. so we were talking to organizations yes they were dealing with complex markets you know obviously the oil industry is going through all sorts of craziness at the moment and uh, lots of things were happening but it really wasn't as focused on one kind of thing so I, I know you've done some research now and McKinsey has done research on what is the impact, how are agile organizations dealing with the, the, the COVID reality? Yeah, yeah. So this is hot off the press, as it were. And I think um, uh, the uh, everything we've just said, and as you said, Dave, like the research we did was pre-COVID, um, you, you would very much expect that an agile organization um, if all of what we said is true, would be able to respond to uncertainty, to external shocks better than a non-agile organization, right? At, at a high level, that thesis would make sense. Um, and so we, we decided to see, well, actually, was that true or not, right? Um, did, uh, given we've had probably the biggest external shock of any of our lives, um, did companies that had undergone agile transformations that were 
at a higher stage of agile maturity, did they actually outperform their less agile peers? Um, and so we did a couple of things. We, we checked publicly available data from over 50 organizations to see how they adjusted their services following the outbreak of COVID-19 in their country. And we also did uh, uh, deep, extensive interviews with 25 additional organizations that had undergone an agile transformation um, prior, to the, prior to the coronavirus uh, in order to probe their experiences. So what you see on slides uh, on, on this slide here is the is one of the outcomes from the first piece of that, the, the publicly available data from 50 organizations. Um, and, and we're looking here at speed of response uh, across telco operators. So here we see that telco operators with higher agile maturity, that's the ones towards the top of the chart, responded faster to shocks than competitors. And specifically, we looked at how long it took them to launch new services uh, in response to COVID-19 in their country. Uh, uh, sort of, uh, and we measured this based on um, 100, the, the data which there are 100 confirmed cases in their particular country. And we looked at uh, how fast they responded relative to the country average response time of all telco operators in that country. And the results, uh, I mean, truly compelling, right? And you see on the page, the most agile telcos responded roughly twice as fast as their non-agile competitors to release new products and services. And not shown here, but we did the exact same analysis also for banks um, across uh, many different countries and get the exact same result, almost twice as fast, the most, uh, the highest agile maturity companies versus the, the no agility companies. Yeah. And, 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 oh, and what we think, is that oh well, yeah so so I think agile organizations again I don't think this will come as a surprise to you Dave right really had an edge because they already had those processes and structures in place um, such as cross-functional teams uh, quarterly business reviews empowered teams uh, clear data and uh, digital systems that that helped them and proved really critical in adapting to the crisis. Yeah. I was very happy when I saw this. I know we spoke about this a few weeks ago. Of, uh, and uh, well, you told me you were doing it uh, a, a while ago, I guess six weeks. I guess it isn't that long ago. It feels like ages. This is COVID time, which is a whole different thing. Anyway, and uh, and then I was like crossing my fingers. And, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, Christopher, if the results aren't good, we, we should probably just bury it, you know. And because um, yeah, obviously Scrum.org's business is all about this, right? But it turns out that actually it does work. And it's, it's not a surprise. It was a very compelling, if, if you read the, the research, Research, there was a very compelling thing about a call center. You know, yeah. COVID hit, the government said, sorry, you can't go to work anymore. Ugh. So what do you do with your call center? This agile organization responded amazingly. Within days, they had an up and running call center with, which was actually using different people. So yeah. they deployed the technology, they deployed the processes, they deployed, and actually they were, they were <laughs> this is the crazy stuff. Their actual customer, uh, satisfaction and the, the t how long you were waiting in a queue, you know, was actually reduced. So both those metrics went up, which I thought was funny. So the guy said, um, the call center manager or the head of the call center said, well, this would have taken us six months if we yeah. weren't already in this way of working. It would have taken us six months, no doubt. We just, we wouldn't even know how to get people yeah. to use the phone, transfer stuff. And it was many things, including technology that availed it, but I thought that was super interesting. Yeah, no, that's right. And, um, you know, so that's, uh, uh, that, that's agile companies versus non-agile companies. Um, when, when we did the interviews of uh, companies that had gone through or were going through agile transformations, um, many of those, in fact, almost the majority of them had not, let's say, move to an agile model everywhere across their entire global organization. Um, so they had some non-agile business units, some agile business units. Um, and so when we spoke to the CEOs in these organizations, we actually probed um, how did the agile parts of your business uh, com uh, perform compared with the non-agile parts. Um, and, uh, and again, the results were clear, right? So those business units that had gone agile before the pandemic perform better um, on customer satisfaction. So the same metrics we've been speaking about all this session, customer satisfaction, employee engagement, operational performance. 
Um, and and we would often hear quotes like uh, you know, some of these on the page. So uh, one European banking CEO told us if we'd not done this agile transformation, um, our de development would have completely stalled during COVID. Um, and uh, and I think you know that shows both um, how the agile parts of the organisation perform better. It also hints at one of the other things we heard, which is oftentimes we'd find that um, resources and ways of working in the agile parts of the organization, like coaches and the like, were actually redeployed to go and help the non-agile parts of the organization to more effectively get through um, the, sh the shock. Um, very interesting results coming out of all of this. So, Christopher, I think that sort of two things really stood out. One thing was the, the emphasis in many of your interviews on discipline that many of these leaders basically said, look, it was the agile events, ceremonies, they called them, which I, you know, yeah. but the, the events, which you know, it like, was yeah. This, <laughs> yeah, which, which we don't particularly like, but it doesn't matter. They used their own words. We didn't change it. You know, it was the ceremonies. It was the structure. It was the backlog. It was the planning process, the frequent planning process. All of that worked. Now, were we doing the same thing that we would have been doing if COVID hadn't come along? Probably not. But that's the whole point, right? We responded and realigned our backlog, our priorities, the, 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 and it kept us together. It kept us moving forward, whereas the non-agile organizations were like, whoa, hang on a minute. This is what we said yeah. we'd be doing. This is, what my, this is what's on my timesheet for this week, but hang on a minute. I can't get access to that system because of the FTP or isn't available yet and I haven't got a machine that can dial into that we I suppose you don't say dial in anymore but connect in etc I thought that was super interesting discipline was the word that I'd have used to describe it and I, I was surprised that that sort of came out so strongly the yeah. other thing that stood out which really sort of blew my mind was and this is the the, the paper talks more about this um that that in times of crisis, Agile actually feels like the most natural thing yeah. in the world. And that's that, that reminded me of a story that Ken Schwaber, the, the, the creator of Scrum, uh, co-creator of Scrum, used to say. He's like, say, it's great. I'd go in, I'd sort everything out, they'd deliver their product, and then I'd move away, and then they'd go back to the norm. And, and also um, GE, uh, same thing, right? You know, Jeff Emmelt said that, 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 you know, he delivered these changes, and then, and then as soon as he moved away, slowly it would dissipate. Yeah. So what was, what's very clear is that it's, um, in, fact, in a crisis, it's just a natural way to work. You empower your team. You give them clear direction. You make things yeah. visible so you know what the hell's yeah. going on, you know. It just goes about saying almost what we what and what the paper talks about is, is it possible after COVID to stay in this mode of operation or ultimately are we just going to go Phew, and back to our silos, back to our you know safety blankets? And we don't know. Right, Christopher? Yeah. Well, look, Dave, I think it's certainly possible, um, but I think it's not going to happen without um, without thoughts and effort. I think the inertial path is to, um, you know, revert in the ways that you described. Um, I, I think what this has shown to many organizations who maybe hadn't had extensive experience with agility beforehand is that, you know, both their people can do it, but they can achieve amazing outcomes um, through this. Oftentimes, actually, that their people enjoy working in these ways. How you then make that sustainable, make it the standard way of working, build it into a system like that. That's when you um, you, know, you really need to put thought into that to, to cross the chasm, as it were. Yeah. And that that's going to be some very interesting times because I'm not sure many of these staff are, want, are going to want to go back to the previous way of working. And I yeah. think you sort of yeah. you, you, you talked about that. And, and I think that that is maybe going to be the case. So I guess it's here to stay. Right. Which is which is good. Um, all right, so we've, we're coming up and we want to make some time for questions. Uh, hopefully, Trish has been collating some really simple questions that Christopher and I can sound smart answering and not picking any of those really hard ones. Just just saying, Chris, uh, just saying, uh, Christopher, you know, and Trish, by the way, just a reminder, I am your boss, um, just in case you forgot that. Anyway, but the um, no, seriously, I want to save some time for this. So let's uh, let's just summarize, try to bring us all together. So. What hopefully we've done over the last 45 minutes is illustrate the fact that, that out of these four 
dimensions, agile organizations see significant improvement. And, and we've focused on these three main things and then the ultimate you know, financial performance. And I think that those three things are really interesting. We haven't particularly focused on what metrics you saw that Christopher and I used many different metrics to describe, because that depends on the industry and the context. Yeah. However, ultimately, we see significant improvement in employee engagement. We see significant improvement around customer uh, engagement, meaning how customers value, whether it's net promoter score or whatever, the, the engagement they have with the organization and the outcomes that they get from that. We see massive operational performance. Actually, that's not a surprise. And in fact, uh, I, many organizations start with their agile around that. You know, when you give, when you empower a team and you allow them to improve the way that they work, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> you get an improvement because, you know, we don't, we don't want to be sort of um, doing rubbish work, right? So, and then that all results in um, quite significant financial performance improvements. And What's interesting, though, for all of this is that it, it, it's about basically building a, the, this next generation operating model. It's building a new organization, new company almost. And what was very telling in all of the study, all of the case studies, though we focused on you know, employee engagement, customer engagement, operational performance, what was very telling was that all these organizations were looking at it from a holistic perspective. Yes. You know, yeah. the shared purpose, the, the organizational structure, which is a network of teams who are supporting organization, this rapid learning, we call them sprints, these, these learn sprint things, these you know, people, a support network to support the people in these teams because they've never got enough skills to do the job, so you need to help them do it, and then the enabling technology. The other thing that's interesting is all these organizations were very mindful of the metrics and the measures that they were trying to achieve. Those OKRs, um, the, the, that, that North Star was translated. You heard Christopher talk a little bit about that earlier, that that um, respect to the New Zealand telecom uh, company, that, that, that North Star was then translated into OKRs, which they then measured and drove that, 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 that process. Um, at at scrum.org, we talk about you know, empirical, um, empirical process, empowered teams, and a maniacal focus on improving in terms of the outcomes we'd achieve and, and how we do it, the work we do. Ultimately, that's at the heart of all of this. And I, I took this um, quote, which actually wasn't from the study because I thought it just said it. You know, I felt like I was looking at the business for a pair of binoculars. The more we're able to eliminate waste, get focused on the real problem, the more transparent that picture came into focus. It's a, you sort of like, start the flywheel and it just goes faster and faster and delivers more and more stuff. I don't know, anything to add to, to my probably very poor summary, but I, I, I did my best. Is there anything I think this is great. Should we do some questions? And we should, but before we do that, I just want to point everybody, we have a survey that we're, so we're doing, continuing to do some research. So you'll see this and it will be in the links in the email that comes to you, but please provide us with some survey stuff. Uh, try to fill in this survey it would be really really useful so uh, and now we can move to questions uh, Trish any really easy questions for Christopher and I well thank you both of you for your examples and um, there are some easy ones but Dave I'm I'm of the mindset that we should do what's right for the customer right so oh, um, and I love being on this side of the um, the webinar but um, I think, I think one thing just to wrap up to make really clear. So um, you've heard um, everyone, you've heard Dave and Christopher mention the five trademarks. That's available on the McKinsey.com website, right? So yeah. they can learn more about yeah. that there. Yeah. You so, can add the um, link to the material. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we'll add the link right. to the material at the so end. We'll, we'll add that so that, that everybody can learn more. But, you know, you quickly it's strategy structure process people technology so you've heard you know a bunch of things that have gone through there it's under those five categories um day uh christopher actually so through the 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 five trademarks and then different implementations on these um with these clients of yours were there other components or other other you know other implementations when you were thinking about agile that needed to exist or that you were you were adamant or here are the first three things that we look like that you think would be helpful 
um, for people listening to it today to think about when they're in their own companies or with their clients? Yeah, so I think what we typically say is that um, when, when thinking about an agile transformation, you're better off um, pulling a broad range of levers in a narrower scope area than kind of just doing one thing um, across the board, right? It, it, we, we've spoken a fair bit around an agile transformation is really a, a system level change. And so that's why we talk about these five trademarks and sort of some actions against, against all of those. Um, I, I think oftentimes one of the mistakes is that people will sort of just uh, you know, st stand up. You know, people often talk about these tribes and squads and sort of maybe just stand up some sort of structural element without addressing sort of mindsets and process. Um, and, and, and I think that's a common failure mode. I mean, uh, agility is at heart a, a mindset and, uh, a, a, and a set of behaviors. If you don't have that, then uh, again, it's a, a cliche, but you can be doing agile without being agile very easily. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, almost don't get started unless you've got um, leaders and the team uh, really truly understanding what it is they're signing up for. Um, and, and then pilots have value. I think, Dave, you mentioned it, sort of pilots without purpose are less less useful than, uh, than having a real uh, direction in mind when you start doing these things, um, but, but important to learn. And then you almost always will get to this tipping point. Um, when you need to think about, do I scale and truly transform the system or, uh, or, or, or do I kind of be content with just having a number of smaller scale team level pieces? Mm -hmm. I just want to pick up on something that Christopher said, because I want to make sure people didn't miss it. And we saw this from all of the people that we talked to. You, you could potentially take one of these traits, you know, the, the network of teams, the organizational element and apply it across the whole uh, whole company and then focus on that. What, what Christopher said was, yeah, you can do that. But really, if you focus it on one business unit, one value stream, one tribe, or one, one area, one nexus, if we're talking sort of like um, Scrum, yeah. you know, if you focus it on that, but not just that, you add the purpose, you add the, you know, the learning cycles, you add the support organizations, you add the tech, and then you're more likely to get a holistic change. And actually, many of the challenges that that organization model has in isolation will be removed. If yeah. you don't do, yeah. And, and so if you want to do it, do it deep and complete, but smaller scope. <clears throat> and then over time, you will then add. I just want to make sure people got that because that's what I've learned um, over the last three years, actually. And, and I think it's something that, isn't as simple as you think because you normally you know sort of focus on one thing and try to apply it in many places actually what we're saying is you you kind of have to do it all but you can narrow it in terms of yeah the business impact as it were mm -hmm. there's no um agile big thing right so we talk about it agile as a, as a mindset agile as a way of working we know it comes from an agile manifesto and and it certainly does not affect Agile does not know what product you should be creating. Agile doesn't understand your strategy. Agile doesn't touch on your leadership, right? So those are things um, that, that definitely need to, to be hit on. So um, there are so many questions, um, and I want to let um, the attendees know that we'll be looking at these questions, and um, Dave and, and Christopher can look at responding to them after, um, after, after this webinar. It will be posted. Um, on the scrum.org website under the Scrum Pulse webcast session. So um, I think we have one minute left and I'm gonna try to wing this. Um, so so uh, Christopher, Dave, you both talked about outcomes. Um, I talk about outcomes a lot. When we've seen the state of Agile, they've said teams and organizations have been doing a great job at thinking about outcomes now. Um, how does that hit when we're talking about the general purpose? And this might be another webinar, but how do how do we start to see when we're talking about enterprise agility? We're focused on that North Star you're referencing. We're focusing on outcomes and purpose. How does that affect accountability? Have you seen in these organizations? So it's interesting you, you asked that because what what I think was very clear from all the examples in, in case studies was that people actually felt accountable, not just for the work that they did, but for the outcomes that that work delivered on. And I think the more successful the agile transformation, the more clear that accountability was to the team. And one of the interesting sort of side notes is that we saw these T-shaped 
people sort of sort of I don't know come out of the uh, the, the the metamorphosis into sort of like these very focused on yeah they they do a particular skill and they have a skill but ultimately they care now about the outcome that picture of that pitch picture of yeah. the customer I think that has been you know, I, I'm not a software engineer anymore. I'm an insurance, I'm working in the insurance industry and I care about helping people spread risk. And I, and, and that was that was fundamentally different, I thought. I don't know, Christopher, if you saw that in terms of accountability. I, I think two points. I, I think um, most common we see that people feel the felt accountability increases significantly. And it's driven by everything from increased transparency, clarity on what they're actually meant to deliver. You know, it's that this is one of the consistent uh, pieces of uh, experience we get back. I think the second point is that for some delivery accountabilities, the, there needs to be a shift from individual to team-based accountability for delivery. And, and in some organizations that is easy, and some that can be more sort of a, a, a shift in, in thinking. Yeah, so just to add to that, that means you have to think about how, compens how, how people and teams are compensated and how that features in the, particularly in financial services, Christopher, we saw that, that if you didn't change the comp model, uh, yeah, you kind of got lip service sometimes. So think a little bit about your incentive and comp model yes. with respect to that accountability. All right, well, on that note, thank you um, for, for sharing these experiences and that knowledge. Again, everybody, there are a lot of great questions on that we'll touch on um, and have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks everybody, stay safe, stay sane.